Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Technology Philosopher. Today I'd like to talk about Henry Bergson on the topic of how cognition works. Henry Bergson was a French philosopher living 1859 to 1941 and writing in the early 1900s. Although we could easily dismiss him in our shiny modern era, his theories of perception and memory still stand as some of the most comprehensive and potentially accurate accounts of the phenomena and are being validated in contemporary neuroscience research. Bergson was a polymath known for anticipating quantum mechanics 30 years ahead of its discovery, partially by noticing that time is asymmetric. He was trained as a mathematician and brought an extensive ongoing knowledge of then-contemporary physics and psychology regarding both normal activity like reading and pathologies like aphasia and brain lesions to bear in creating his theories. Bergson's theory of perception and memory involves the interaction of mind and body in independence from each other as integral parts of a dynamic process. Memory is not a weaker form of perception as Kant, Locke, and others saw it. Bergson's work is discussed in his books, Time and Free Will, published in 1889, where he takes up the free will determinism debate, and Matter and Memory, published in 1896, where he tackles mind-body dualism, or the materialist-idealist debate. Suzanne Gerlach's book, Thinking in Time, published in 2006, provides a nice introduction to these books and connects the ideas to the work of other philosophers such as Deleuze. One important concept Bergson uses throughout his work is that of doubling. This is the notion of two dimensions of phenomena occurring simultaneously, the quantitative and the qualitative. We have the objective, quantifiable, measurable experience of the external world together with our subjective, qualitative, immeasurable, internal experience. Doublings occur with time, intensity, states, memory, and also with the self and consciousness. Bergson focuses on time, distinguishing the difference between objective, external measured clock time and the interior experience of time, which he calls duration. This is the subjective sense of waiting for a train or of time passing quickly when you are having fun. Time is important to consider because we overspatialize the world. It is easy to see space. We divide and segment the world in terms of space. Further, we think of time in terms of space the blocks of hours or days in a calendar, for example. However, it is critical to Bergson that we tune into the subjective experience of time to exercise our free will. We are more disposed to freedom and free will when we choose spontaneous action, and this happens when we are oriented towards the qualitative aspects of internal experience and see time as a dynamic overlap between states, not boxes on a calendar. Giving his resolution to the free will determinism debate that free will is exercised through the qualitative experience of time as duration, Bergson turns to the mind-body problem, the issue that neither the mind nor the body can fully explain the other. Matter and memory is organized to first consider image perception and the role of the body, second, memory and image recognition, Third, how memory and images endure. And fourth, connecting memory and perception back to concepts from the book Time and Free Will, such as duration. Bergson examines relations between the body and mind and finds that perception and memory are a dynamical interactive process of the body and mind with overlapping images and states triggered by sensory motor stimulus. For him, counter to Kant, Images of external objects are not a function of our own brain structure, rather they are outside the body and exist externally as part of objects. The body does not create representations nor store them in some part of the brain, 
The body selects images and materializes them when triggered by a stimulus. There are two kinds of memory. The past survives in two distinct forms. First is motor memory or habit memory, motor mechanisms of the body acting automatically, interacting with the present. The second real kind of memory is pure memory, image memory, the virtual. It has nothing to do with the brain and does not engage with the present. It gives us dream images and it is materialized as perception requires. Failure of memory is not due to the mental part of memory, but of the motor mechanism for bringing memory into action. The process of memory and perception is schematized in Bergson's famous diagram of the memory cone, which extends from point S, that of perception, images, and action on the plane of existence, to the other end, the slice AB that is pure memory the virtual, a diffuse mixing of images. The process of perception and memory is such that we sense images. In fact, the only thing we sense is images. In a physical material way, the contours of the object are inscribed on us as if the object imprints itself on us at a motor level. Memory then pulls onto the received perceptual image, input, old images from the past that resemble it. These pure memories develop themselves into memory images, which insert themselves into the motor schema. The process of perception and memory is dynamic, not static. Perception and memory images are not fixed things, but processes through which one becomes the other. Memory recreates the initial perception. Pure memory actualizes itself as it comes into contact with perception through the intermediary of the motor schema. Pure memory is virtual. It ebbs and flows and merges with perception. It cannot be physically localized. Memory does not exist until it is actualized through interaction with perception or in the mode of dream. To ask where memories are stored, is to miss the point that memory is dynamical and on demand, it is a process. It is more relevant to ask how memory is stored and accessed. The energies of the mind move up and down between the various tiers of the memory cone in a dynamical circuit, mixing idea and image and mind and matter. To understand this better, let's try an example. Try to retrieve a memory yourself. Any memory. What happens? Awareness is pulled back from this present moment and we place ourselves in the past. We try to localize a particular moment like the trial and error action of focusing a camera. Little by little, it condenses into an actual image. Notice that this is a flow, a process not a static state. Deprivileging access uh, space and the idea of memory is stored somewhere and focusing on time to elucidate dynamical processes, mind-body mind dualism is not an either or, but a larger frame which understands the two together as integral constituents of a dynamical process. Bergson's conclusion is dense and profound. The core argument of time and free will is that we need to get back into direct contact with the real by placing ourselves in true duration whose flow is continuous, a lived continuity. We must tune into subjective experience. In matter and memory, Bergson now extends the concept of duration from time to matter and being in general. We are able to place ourselves in the duration of being through thought. The way we can place ourselves in the duration of being through thought involves the use of a critical theory of matter, which Bergson then starts to develop. The critical theory of matter relates to recognizing that thinking already begins in four dimensions, not three. Time is not added. We don't have forms and then change 
A form is change, is time. A thing is its manner of moving and its constituting itself. Time and change are not added later. Movement is indivisible. It cannot be mapped or divided onto space. Any division of matter is artificial. Real movement is what we will call duration for movement, the internal change of state or quality of movement. This summary explained how the French philosopher Henry Bergson offered a resolution to the free will determinism debate that free will is exercised through the qualitative experience of time as duration in his book, Time and Free Will. And then how he offers a resolution to the mind-body problem, also known as the materialist-idealist debate in matter and memory, by extending the concept of duration to matter and being in general, such that real movement the subjective change in states, means that we do not have forms and then change, but that dynamism and change is part of form. And therefore, that mind-body dualism is not an either-or situation, but a larger frame which understands the two together as integral constituents of a dynamical process. Thank you. See you next time. Please send suggestions and questions to technologyphilosopher at gmail.com.